a little bit just to show you where I came from to see where I'm coming from now. All right. Um, one of the things we opposed back 10 years ago was outcomes-based education, and it had a psychological test that they were giving to students and uh, had been given to students, but it used to be that the school was graded on the test, not the students. With outcomes-based education, they were going to grade the students on the test, and they had 53 learning outcomes, and, and they were basing their standards on the test they didn't begin for years. So here is from 19... Right. 1975. Uh, the, the test they gave in 1975 was called the EQA, Educational Quality Assessment. Right. And it was uh, so the EQA, the state it was a state mm -hmm. test, and the state uh, wrote some documents to explain how what their philosophy was in testing. So they had some academic goals, and they also had one called citizenship. And in the state's explanation of how they tested citizenships, they talked about the NAEP, that's the national exam, and they says uh, the national objectives were used, the, the na these national objectives were used to provide the frame of reference for what, what was to be measured. Objectives in the factual domain, such as knowing the structure of government and understanding problems in international relations, were not considered when developing scales. So they specifically said in citizenship, they didn't test <clears throat> students' knowledge of the structure of government. So this is one of the reasons why I'm trying to educate people on the Constitution is because you didn't get it in school and you're not getting it in the media. And uh, just to go on a little bit about this before I go to the Constitution is, so if they weren't testing things in the factual domain for citizenship, what did they test? Well, to assess citizenship, I'm reading from their document. To assess citizenship, a behavior reference model incorporating elements related to the psychological notion of threshold is used. A threshold refers to the set of conditions necessary to bring about desirable responses. Thus, by varying the, situa varying the situation and introducing conditions of reward and punishment, we are able to, to determine cutoff levels at which students will display positive behavior. <coughs> So it was a psychological test. They said it right here. They're using the psychological notion. So instead of testing the facts, if you know the Constitution, they're doing behavior modification, psychological modification. So this is one of my motivations to educate people because they have been brainwashed if they went to public school. Okay, now we're going to go on with the Constitution. Uh, I call it Constitution as a law because it sounds like constitutional law. If you go talk to someone who is a constitution, constitutional law expert, they don't talk about the Constitution. They talk about Supreme Court decisions. So I have some books that say constitutional law and they talk about Supreme Court decisions. I have one book that says major Supreme Court decisions. That's honest. So if you're going to teach about major Supreme Court decisions, title it that. Don't call it constitutional law because it's not. I'm going to teach the Constitution as a law without referring to Supreme Court decisions. I'm going to refer to the people who wrote the document. So uh, let me do my PowerPoint. Uh, that's just the introduction here, so that's not great with what happened. What's that? I should have 80 pages here. Uh, where did it go? It's the first time I ever gave a PowerPoint presentation. Even when we were in there. F5, full screen. Okay. Um, I'm an engineer, so I examine the Constitution as an, from an engineering perspective, and I see it as a design, as an ingenious design. And other people have too. The uh, William Gladstone, the uh, Prime Minister of England once in the 1800s, said the uh, American Constitution is, so far as I can see, the most wonderful work ever struck at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. And I agree with him. I would call it the greatest design ever. And George Washington, in his inaugural address, he basically said it, it's a good design and it was, couldn't have been done without God's hand. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all that because uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm, I got 80 pages and I'm not sure I'm going to make it, so I'm going to skip through things. All right, uh, okay, no, okay, we're going to talk about the, okay, so the purpose of government. All right, the extremes of government, according to the media, is left and right, fascism, socialism. But fascism and socialism and communism, 
They're all 100% governments. The Founding Fathers talked about the real extremes of government. It's anarchy and despotism, right? Um, if we have anarchy, there are no police, your neighbors come and steal all your stuff. That's not good. If we have dictatorship, the government comes and steals all your stuff. So we need somewhere in the middle. Uh, so we know that James, John Jay said in the Federalist Papers that we must cede some of the government, some of our rights in order to vest it with the requisite powers to protect the other rights. George Washington, in a letter to Tom, that's Tom Paine, Tom Paine, he said in his uh, Common Sense paper, it's a famous document, uh, man finds it necessary to surrender a part of his property to furnish the means to protect the rest. So both of these people are saying you have to give up your rights, a little bit of your rights, a little bit of your property to the government so that they can press the, protect the rest of your rights, rights and the rest of your property. All right, so George Washington, when uh, the Constitutional Convention met, finalized it, and they sent the letter off to the Continental Congress. George Washington put a cover letter on it, and uh, in it, he gave a little few principles here. He talks about individuals entering into society must give up a share of liberty to preserve the rest. Same concept by three different people. Uh, but now he's talking about the line. It is at all times difficult to draw with precision the line between those rights which must be surrendered and those which must be reserved. So that's the big question of this design, is he's drawing that line in a good place. All right, now, James Madison, written to Thomas Jefferson, said is a melancholy reflection that liberty should be equally exposed to danger when the government has too much or too little power, and the line that divides these two extremes should be inaccurate, so inaccurately defined by experience. So we've never had a government as great as ours with as much freedom for the people. And we now have more experience in where to draw the line. But they were guessing, and so they had, they had good engineering analysis, according to my opinion, to find the line where it had to be so we could still maintain freedom over all these years. All right, and then the, uh, Alexander, Ham Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers talked about the extremes of anarchy and tyranny. So this is Founding Fathers' words telling you that the extremes are anarchy and despotism, so 0% government and 100% government. So anyone who talks about any other extreme is deceiving you, uh, including Rush Limbaugh. A few months ago, he said, he was talking about the Democrats and the Republicans. Democrats want full government, and he said the Libertarians want no government. That's wrong. That's, that would be an anarchist. An anarchist wants no government. Libertarians want a small government, smaller than the Republicans do. So you can argue about whether the Libertarians want too small of a government, but you can't call them anarchists like Rush Limbaugh did. That's a, another <coughs> huge deception. I was yelling to Rush Glad to stop somebody. All right. Uh, okay, so now, one of the fundamental design principles thought I had here, huh, is that the Founding Fathers, if you look at communism and all those other forms of government, they all say, you have needs as the people, we'll take from him and give to you. So, uh, but usually what happens when they take from the rich to give to the poor, most of it goes in their pockets and the pockets of their friends and never makes it to the poor. So, our Founding Fathers realize you can't find angels and put them in government. Maybe if you had an angel, you could have a socialist government. He would divide it and without taking it and give it to his friends. But we are administering a, a government by humans over humans, so we must realize the fact, in our design, design for the fact that there are going to be corrupt people in office. So I'm going to read several quotes about the Founding Fathers, all saying, basically, you, you have, you, uh, love of power is a dangerous thing. So uh, this is James Madison in Federal Paper, 41. Uh, he's talking about because it, oh, no, this is the title. I didn't need that one. But he basically, in, his, this, in the design of the Constitution, if you make the government too small, if there's some emergency that comes up and people say the government should do something, well, the government will, even if it's unconstitutional. So Mad Madison is saying, don't make it too small. Make sure you put some things in there because if there's a necessary, obvious government power that you say they can't do, they're going to do it anyway, and they're going to set the precedent many times by uh, violating, and then pretty soon they won't have to violate the Constitution at all because they've set the precedent in something you should have given them. So that's, the, that's part of the design of giving it the minimum powers. And he's talking about was war. Okay, it's Declaration of Independence, one of our founding documents, it says uh, we're endowed by our Creator with rights, and that uh, we to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Right? If you compare that side by side with the preamble, it talks about uh, you've heard it all to secure the blessings. What I'm bringing, putting these two up together here, where no one points this out, secure and secure, both our Declaration and the Constitution preamble 
say the purpose of government is to secure our rights. So the philosophy here is government doesn't give us our rights. Our creator gave us our rights. Government secures. So I want to go now to make hammer that point home. I talk about a security guard. If I go to the bank and take out a thousand dollars, and on my way out, the security guard is standing there, and I shake his hand. I say, I want to thank you, Mr. Security Guard, for giving me this thousand dollars. He would say, You're, You don't have to thank me. That's your money. I'm just protecting it. Same thing with the government. The government isn't giving you rights. You don't have to thank them. It's their, You have the rights. You own them. They're your inalienable rights. The government is supposed to protect those rights. That's their job. They're public servants. If you read the Founding Fathers' letter, they all talk about your humble servant. They all knew they were servants. They weren't rulers. We don't want leaders. We want servants. So, uh, uh, secure rights. I have one more comment on that. Uh, I'll go on. Okay, secure these right there. So this is dumped off. I just put in writing what I was going to say there. Uh, okay, oh, this is a, if I print this out someday, this is a nice uh, someone diagram the preamble to the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, <coughs> provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. Uh, okay, so in there they mentioned posterity. So the Constitution, some people say it's old and outdated, we should throw it out. The engineers of the Constitution designed it to have a long life. It wasn't a disposable government. So even though they, they so they, and it's not a mistake that it lasted this long, they said to ourselves and our posterity to secure the blessings. So, uh, and right now the Constitution is the oldest of the world's Constitution. No nation in history has ever gone through 44 peaceful transitions of power to the top guy, our president. Uh, that's a record that proves the design criteria of making it last a long time is still good, and so we should not be scrapping it or making any major changes to it. All right, I mentioned federal papers a few times. Uh, uh, this is, if you read a lot of the Founding Fathers, they talk about a lot of people you might want to know, Locke, Montesquieu, and, and Hume, or whatever, and I haven't read them much. What I figured out is my shortcut to save time in learning this is they've read them all, and they quote them now and then. So, and None of the governments that those people talk about ever existed. They didn't have government. They had a lot of theories. This was the first time these, so th those guys were probably doing the research and development. Uh, the founding fathers did the design. They looked at the research and development work, which was all theory, and put together a real document, a real design, and it's working. So it, you can save time by first studying the final design, not the theory behind it. So read the final design, which is the, the Constitution. And to help understand it, you read the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers, uh, if you're going to write a book with the Federalist Papers, they always put the little caption on there, you know, so-and-so said this is a wonderful book and great, and, and they put those in there. Here's two captions we would put on the, Federal, on the Federalist Papers. Uh, George Washington. Uh, first of all, the author, authors of the Federalist Paper were uh, not revealed at the time. They were called Publius. They wrote 84 papers in a New York newspaper. They started after the Constitutional Convention met. 1787 September, they started writing papers in New York, uh, these federal papers. And the reason why they picked New York was the Constitution said if three fourths of the states ratify it, they'll become the United States. Those who don't won't. So this was a choice. And New York was considered a key state. It was large in the middle. They knew that if New York didn't join, the Union wouldn't last, maybe. So they identified their pollsters, identified the New York as a battleground state, so they focused their propaganda effort in New York. Now, the authors were secret, so Washington found out he's an insider, he knows who wrote the paper. So he sends a letter to Alexander Hamilton, who was one of the authors, and said, uh, I looked at the political papers called it, and he says, that work will notice the merit of posterity, because in it are candidly, candidly and ably discussed the principles of freedom and the topics of government. So again, posterity. George Washington said we should read the Federalist Papers right here, as he's complimenting Hamilton. So we should read it if you want to understand the government. Uh, now, James, Tom Jefferson wrote the James Madison. James Madison wrote a lot of the Federalist Papers, too. Hamilton wrote the most, J uh, Madison second, and Jay only wrote three out of the 84. So Jefferson finds out who, reads, who wrote the Federalist, so he's writing. This is November. You know, this Constitution was signed in September, October, November. It's two months later. 
Jefferson's reading all the papers. They have, they're not all out yet because uh, it, it took like a year and a half or something to do 84. So they probably got 50 or something at least. And uh, so he says, I read the Federalist, and he calls the Federalist Papers the best commentary on the principles of government, with government which ever was written. So Jefferson recommends the Federalist Papers. Uh, but he disagrees with the design. He thinks there should be a Bill of Rights. And I'm going to go into that in detail later. Uh, and just about the Constitutional Convention, uh, one of the things that usually happens in revolutions, you have a bad government, people rise up, militia, they take over, and whoever's the general now becomes the king, and he becomes bad. This was different. Our general resigned. Uh, the federal government was almost dissolved, basically, and the states were pretty much in control, and they were, there was no war, so there was peace, mild season of peace. They came up with a plan, thought it carefully through, through four months, and they only recommended the plan. They didn't impose it. Usually after the revolution, uh, the general's in charge of the whole land. This was an option. They knew it was a good idea, so they knew they didn't have to force it on people. Uh, uh, just in the Declaration of Independence, we talk about uh, whenever any form of government becomes destructive, our rights are duty to overthrow the government, to overthrow the government and lay new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form. So these are engineering words to me. Uh, so the design assumption here is that all humans, or okay, one of the design assumptions in that's hidden in that statement there is uh, humans are flawed, sinners, and are prone to abuse. Most of the founding fathers were Christians, so they knew we're all sinners, and even the best of us have sins and flaws, and if you have power, you get corrupt. Uh, so they talk about, in, if you read some of the founding documents, you'll talk about ambitious, Cabals of a few, that's a conspiracy. And in the Federalist Paper, I, this was an incomplete slide. I, I usually document everything, but yeah. Why would the states cede such power to the federal government when they, the states had a lot more power in the Articles of Confederation? Because they wanted the union. They knew, uh, they were basically afraid of, they wanted the strength in numbers. If a foreign power came in and just attacked one state and the state didn't well, get along with the other ones and they could take over that one state. So it was mainly, uh, I guess when I get to the Jefferson quote, Jefferson talks about how, how he sees the federal government. He'll, that might explain that. And basically, they wanted the, it, was, it was a free trade zone, and it was uh, a, a stronger army. So we, you know, when they say we, the Article Federation had it was too weak, so we had to have a strong federal government. They didn't make a strong federal government. They made a strong army in the federal government, but it wasn't that strong of a government. They just delegated enough powers to be to be to have free trade and to have a central army that, so that we could act as one nation so now no one would attack us. Uh, so in my design assumption that men are flawed, uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Kentucky Resolutions. When they passed the Kentucky Resolutions, it was Kentucky people who introduced it. No one knew Jefferson wrote it. He wrote it for a buddy on the side. Twenty-something years later, when he almost di was dying, he admitted he wrote it. So uh, if you, that's why we don't know the date. I try to document everything I do here. Back. Uh, okay, in the Federalist Paper, I don't have a document. Hamilton makes a statement that enlightened statesmen may not may not always be at the helm. So our government was designed with we might have an idiot in the office, and we might have to do with him for four or eight years, and the government should still survive. It should not be totally dependent like a king would be. So uh, all right, now Jefferson says. Now we're going with Jefferson. Um, in, when he wrote the Kentucky Resolutions, they, they presented this to the legislature to, uh, I guess it was the Alien and Sedition Acts they were opposed to, so, so was Jefferson, so he basically wrote this, someone else put it in their name, and uh, so that's why we don't have a date, because uh, he, we don't know when he handed it off. All right, so he says, it's a famous quote, everyone should know this, was, that confidence is everywhere the parent of despotism. In, despotism. in questions of power, then, let no more be heard of confidence in man but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. So everyone should know that and where it came from, and that's why I'm trying to be picky on the date here. Uh, so you've all heard of the chains of the Constitution, but it comes with confidence. We, you don't vote for some guy because you like him and just let him do what he wants because he's a good guy. He wouldn't do anything bad. So you don't. Not having confidence in your president or any elected official is a, how the people should behave. And the way we should protect them from mischief is the Constitution. So the Constitution is a law. I'm going to, that's the title of my speech, Constitution as a Law. I'm going to get to where I got that word from Madison. But it, it is a law that the government follows. We, the people, made a law the government follows. 
they make laws we follow. And if they don't obey their law, we don't have to obey their law. All right, so I'm just going to go with uh, this is all love of power thing. So if you read the Federal Paper 17, uh, Hamilton's talking about the love of power, which any reasonable man could require. The regulation of the mere domestic police of a state appears to me <coughs> to hold out slender allurements of ambition. Commerce, commerce, finance, negotiation, war seem to comprehend all the objects which have charms for minds governed by that passion. And then he talks about the disposition in the federal councils to usurp with which they are connected. Okay, now, usurped. I never hear that word. If you read the Declaration of Independence, it's in there multiple times. It's uh, um, usurp means to take power without right. Take power that doesn't belong to you. So if you're a president and you pass a law, you have usurped the legislative power. It's If you read the Declaration, that's what the king was doing. The king was usurping all kind of power that didn't belong to him. And so that's a word they use all the time, which we never use, and they're doing more usurpation today than they had back then. So we had to bring back that word. Uh, all right, in George Washington's farewell address, uh, it used to be 30 years ago, I was walking through the library. They were closing it. Uh, walking through the aisle, I saw all these big, thick, boring books, and I saw this little skinny one. And I was curious, I picked it up, and it was George Washington's farewell address. I never heard of it. Uh, I took it out. It's uh, real short, and it said in there, every kid in high school reads this George Washington's farewell address. It's so famous. We don't now. We don't even know. never heard of it. So we should, as one on your reading list, Federalist Papers, and the uh, George Washington's farewell and inaugural address. So in his farewell address, he's talking about not trusting people, inspire caution, uh, and he's talking about the love of the power that prone, and the proneness to abuse it, which predominates in the human heart, and then, and then he talks about the design, the necessity of reciprocal checks in the exercise of political powers by dividing and distributing into each <laughs> different, so the dividing the power, that's balancing it out, different depositors. So uh, he's going through some design philosophy. This is his farewell address. So Madison was Washington's speech writer. So this is really Madison and Washington and Greeks. Um, okay, in Federal 84, I'm just not giving the full context, but I'm just letting you see the phrases. They talk about men disposed to usurp. So as they're designing it, they're saying, all right, if we got some guy who seems like a nice guy, but he, you know, he's going to be power hungry when he gets in here, what would he do? So we put checks on him. Sam Adams, I'm not sure what he had to do with the Constitution, but he had a good quote here. He was talking about the Swedes, and they had some nice guy. They elected him. They made him dictator. They did not consider his ambition. Uh, um, they gave him all the powers, <coughs> stopped elections, and power in its nature is encroaching, and is such the human make that men who are vested with a share of it are generally inclined to take more than it was intended they have, the love of power, like the love of money, increasing with his possession. So the guy says, uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, Lord Acton. That's the same thing, different words. Okay, uh, Federalist 51, talking about human nature again. Uh, my brain is human nature stuff. This is usually, you know, every time I hear something uh, about, uh, well, don't you want a national health care plan? The poor should have uh, health care services. And I'm thinking, well, you want all my medical records in a government database. I don't trust people with my medical records uh, in the government. So things like that. So it's not paranoid to behave like that. That's how we founding fathers created our government. You don't give the government too much power. It's not the government's job to provide for all of our needs. I got a, I was on my list to find. Uh, G. Edward Griffith in 72 or 74 somewhere wrote, and I kept paraphrasing instead of quoted, uh, when you have a government that can provide for you all that you need, you have a government that can take from you all that you want. So that's one of my philosophies of why the government shouldn't get too big. Because if it's big enough to give us everything, then it can take everything. And they won't give us everything. There'll be corrupt people in there, and they will take everything from us without giving to us. So it's in theory, if you had a nice guy and you could put good dictators in there, having a government that could provide all your needs might be good. But in reality, we're engineers deal, reality, not theory. Uh, you can't trust humans with that much power. The answer isn't to make take one good guy and give him all the power and make everything good, because you can't find one good guy. And even if you do find one good guy, he'll get corrupt. That's our design assumption. 
Uh, so he's talking about in his design, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interests of the place of, of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection, I should say a bad reflection, on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. And this is a great clause here we should know. So when people say, why don't you trust government? You should say, but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human natures? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither internal nor external controls on government would be necessary. But in framing a government which is to be administered by, administered <laughs> by men over men, uh, the history, uh, history has, experience has taught us mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. That's an engineering clause. We always have backup. I work in safety critical software things. I worked on nuclear power plants. And if one thing goes wrong, it doesn't blow up. You would expect an engineer to have to make something go wrong. You'd have to have seven things all go wrong maybe before it happens. So we always design auxiliary precautions. So the Constitution is full of all the what they call the checks and balances. Mm -hmm. I call auxiliary precautions. They're backups to power being concentrated. It's basically trying not to concentrate the power. Right, uh, George Washington, when he was, I showed you a part of this letter before, it's when he, the cover letter, when he sent the Constitution to the Continental Congress for, to, for their information, uh, he uh, wrote some other stuff in here. So this is just a good, if you want to know uh, what powers we gave to the federal government and why, he's saying here, uh, this is answer your question, I think, uh, the friends of our country uh, have long seen and desired that the power of making war, peace, and treaties, that of levying money and regulating commerce, and the correspondent executive and judicial authorities should be fully invested in a general government. Right, so this is a quick list of well, the Articles of the Federation had some flaws. This was going to fix them. And this is in one sentence uh, the, the uh, overall uh, features of the new government. So the Continental Congress, the, under the Articles of Confederation, had only a Congress. They didn't have an executive and judicial. So this Constitution improved that design and added an executive and a judicial branch. It didn't have the power to regulate commerce. It really, uh, with the war, uh, I think all the states had to declare war. This now, if Congress, without this approval of every state, makes a declaration of war, you can do it. So, uh, but he's saying, but the impropriety, now he's saying the impropriety of delegating such extensive trust into one body is evidence. So he said we couldn't just fix the Articles of Confederation with, with Congress. So he said, hence the results of a new design. That's Washington. All right, Federal 41, Madison also has a quick list, I call them, uh, of what the Constitution is going to do. So uh, he, in Federal 41, he's talking about this, and he's talking about the, the federal government is going to secure against foreign danger, regulation of intercourse with foreign nations, uh, basically we're trading with foreign nations right now. Before that, you know, one nation could trade with, with Pennsylvania, another one New York, and New York might have one tariff and Pennsylvania another, and then we have tariff wars, and it would be better if we all had, if we gave that to the federal government and we act as one. So all the nations know if you want to trade with any state, you deal with the president or the, you know, the, the, the Senate, but not each state. You can't go out to each government and get your way and get some kind of deal. Uh, so, so the general unity, and the restraint of the state. So in the Constitution, they res there's, or it says the federal government can do this, and the states cannot do this. So the states can't act, enact treaties. That's a clause in the Constitution. And uh, then there's the necessary and proper clause. He's probably referring to there. Uh, they're allowed to make it's a kind of an elastic clause. They call it the Constitution. They have these powers, and then they have the powers that are necessary and proper to carry out those powers. So if you want to get literal sometimes about what power they have, the necessary and proper gives them some extra power uh, to do some of the enumerated powers. Frank? Yeah. What do you mean by certain miscellaneous um, objects of general utility? Where's that? Uh, number five? four. Four? Yeah. Certain miscellaneous objects? <coughs> you I don't know. Not I sure. haven't studied this carefully. I was just, okay. I like the fact that it just had, instead of reading the whole Constitution, you had, this is a good summary if you want to give a summary and, and it was a okay. restraint. General unity. I would have to study that more. Okay. Uh, okay, now, uh, this is an authority quality. This is 58, 70, somewhere. Some, I wrote a book about, uh, what's it called? Understanding the Constitution. And uh, I usually don't like people who write this, but he wasn't bad. He gave a nice, I can't find this anywhere else. We always talk about the federal government. And then it's, 
we need a good definition. So I, I didn't find one from the Valley Fathers. Maybe there is one. I don't know where it is. But the, the best definition that I found that the, this his definition correlates with everything I've read of the founding fathers. So he says the federal government is one in which the Constitution divides governmental power between a central and a subdivisional government, giving to each substantial functions, in contrast to a unitary system. So this is what a lot of other countries are. I, I, I'll show you the Soviet Union Constitution. They have a unitary system, in, or ones in which the Constitution vests the government all the power in a central government, and uh, the central government sub delegates authority to the local units, but it's if it ever wants to, it can take that power back. So uh, that's not what we have. So people think that uh, uh, because of the supremacy clause of the Constitution that all federal laws trump state laws. That's false. The Constitution says basically that all laws made by the federal government in compliance with the Constitution trump state laws. So if the, cons if the you know, the, um, 55 mile an hour speed limit. That's a state law. If the federal government says you can't drive 55, that they don't have the authority to do that. That would be overturned. Uh, so, 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 I was going to pull it in here. The supremacy clause. We'll get to that later, maybe. In a federal. Okay. So basically, in our federal government, we have the federal government has power off. In the federal system, I didn't read the last paragraph. In the federal system, the Constitution is the source of both central and subdivisional authority. Each unit has a core power independent of the wishes of those who control it. So it's not like the, we give it all to the federal government and they delegate something to the states. We delegate it to each. That's a design feature of we, you know, the way you have tyranny is you have all power, legislative, executive, judicial, in one branch, in one central government. This, so everyone heard of the separation of powers between legislative, executive, and judicial. This is describing the, I call them horizontal separation, horizontal powers. This is the vertical separation of powers of between the federal and the state. There are powers we gave to the state and powers to the state, federal. And in order to have a central ty tyranny, the federal government would have to take from the states. And ambition must be made to counteract ambition, Madison said. In order for the federal government to take the state's powers, there's greedy politicians there they'd be taking it from who would be losing their jobs. So they, it was based on people being power hungry, and if you d divide the power and balance it in such ways that when anyone encroached and tried to usurp someone else's power, they would fight back with the tools they have. So this is a good explanation of federalism. So I say I believe in federalism. This is what I mean. Hamilton, Federalist 9. Right. Okay, there's a place in here where I I printed out 80 slides and then I uh, sorted them. And then I tried to sort the screen to fit here and, and I, wasn't, I, I know where that spot is. I'm not sure it's here yet. Uh, good, that's just good. Uh, this is Alexander Hampton. He's talking about the we're not eliminating the state governments, you know, and uh, and taking a lot of their power. We're actually kind of merging them a little bit by the at, at that time before the Seventeenth Amendment, the state legislatures appointed members of the Senate. So we, the people, voted for our congressmen. So all the House members were voted for by the people, but all the senators were appointed by the uh, their state legislatures. So these. Usually, I guess the governor appointed, nominated, and their Senate, state Senate confirmed. And at the time when they repealed that in 1913, they said there were too many corrupt deals. People would buy a Senate seat, and we had too many bad senators in there. I'm thinking, uh, I don't know if that's the new method didn't get better people in there. But so, so either way, we got corrupt senators in there. But now, this, by repealing the 17th Amendment, we did a major design change without thinking of all the side effects. And one of the side effects is if the federal government, you know, recently, uh, 20 years ago, everyone had speed limits, whatever they wanted to. The federal government knew they didn't have the power to change the speed limits, the speed limits everywhere to 55. So what they did was they used the backdoor technique. They told states, we'll cut off the highway money in your district if you don't change the law. So states, all states set speed limit. But they do it under the force of losing money from the federal government. And uh, if the Senate was confirmed by the state houses, 
That would be the senator telling his boss what to do. It would have never passed. So that's just one example. There's all kind of things. Since the 17th Amendment has passed in 1913, power has been sh shifting from the state to the federal government. It's been usurped by the federal government, and the check that would have stopped that is not there anymore. So either way, we have, I think, just as good people in the Senate, but now their motivation is they don't care about states' rights anymore, and we are now centralizing. So that was a huge design flaw. There weren't many, if you look at study, I, I drew the, 20 years ago, 25, I drew block diagrams of legislative, executive, judicial, state, people, and I drew lines, and I said, you know, one of the checks is we vote, we write to assemble, uh, president can veto a law, the House and the Senate can override the veto. So I drew lines between all the blocks with all the powers, and you look, there aren't many lines between the state and the federal, the major one was the 17th, before the 17th Amendment, was the direct election of the, uh, the not the direct, the, the appointment of s senators by the state legislature. That check is gone. So uh, you're, I'm going to show you some quotes by the founding fathers where they say people are worried about the federal government getting too concentrated and, 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 and too big over the states. And all the founding fathers are saying that will never happen. And it sounds like they were wrong. They weren't wrong. With the design they had, it wouldn't have happened. With that design change, they never knew that we'd be dumb enough to make that design change. So it's, it's the original engineers were good. The new engineers in 1913 screwed the design, but it's still holding together, and we should understand where the fault in the design is and try and plug that back up if we can. And actually, I've got a plan. Since it might be politically hard to do, I like the compromise technique. i got a proposal just releasing it public for the first time is we, we do a half repeal of the 17th Amendment. We make 17, we make 50 senators appointed by the legislature of, the, of their state, and then we make 50 of them by direct election. That's a compromise. Yeah. That's looking across the aisle. That's my plan, so. so. Good. Line of direct representatives. So he's saying states are going to have powers. Uh, uh, okay, now they, we keep talking here about limited government. Here's one of the quotes. Madison, Federal Paper 45, says the powers proposed by the pro the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined, and those which remain with the state governments are numerous and indefinite. Hmm. All right, and he talks about the <coughs> former that the federal government shall be exercised principally on external objects, such as war, peace, negotiation, forms, commerce which the power of taxation will, for the most part, be connected. So if you're going to have a war and you have a big army, you need tax money. So the Continental Congress did not have power to tax. So during the Revolutionary War, uh, General Washington had to beg, go to the Continental Congress and beg all the states to volunteer money. So all of the Revolutionary War was paid with volunteered money from the state taxes, but the federal government did not have the power to tax. So they're saying if you're going to have a federal army, you need to be able to raise money for that and some other things, some other small things. All right, uh, now, powers reserved to six. So here's, I'm going with power flows again. Uh, powers that we the people have all the power. Oh. Is that where it was? No. Two, four. Delegation. All right. Uh, powers delegated <coughs> by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. And uh, powers reserved. So the states have power, or have surrendered some of their power to the federal government, but they reserve some other ones. And they're basically internal. So my big beef is education. Uh, there is no power in the Constitution for the federal government to do <coughs> anything with education, and they are, and it's totally unconstitutional. And so that would be you know, another great idea I got. People want to reduce the size of the Pennsylvania legislature. It's 203. They say it's one of the largest. They're, they're overpaid. I don't want to do that because I want to keep states strong because we need strong states to counter a, uh, we need a full-time strong legislature to counter the federal government. And my compromise to help do that is we should eliminate the federal department of education. We should eliminate the Pennsylvania State Board of Education. And now all the regulations that were done by the state board should be done by the legislature. So my plan isn't to reduce the legislature, to give them more work and keep them full time. Okay, now, here's Thomas Jefferson. I read this 20 years ago. I've never seen anyone else. This has shaped my 
federalism idea more than anything here. Uh, he gave a nice general idea of how the federal government should work. This is during the Constitutional Convention. He's not there, he's in France, but he's, his ideas have been known to people, and his idea that he's talking about what he thinks should happen is what happened. He says his general plan would be the Constitution should make the states look as one to everything connected with foreign nations, several that they're purely domestic. So when a king of some other country does some kind of deal with the United States, he thinks about the president and the secretary of state. He doesn't talk to governors. He doesn't talk to legislatures. That's not how he looks. So from the outside, everyone looks at the United States as one government. Inside, citizens of Pennsylvania think of ourselves as citizens of Pennsylvania and the United States. So when we talk about who should be doing what with education, we should say, okay, I don't like what's going on in my school. Let's go to Harrisburg. We shouldn't have to go to Washington. That's not a good design. So the powers that power should be kept locally as much as possible. You can't have 12 armies, you know, 13 armies, so that was good they made the armies a federal, but not the uh, education now. Uh, so this is a good idea. The, uh, it's a good, I like overall view. So it's a good overall view of the design is uh, the states look as one internally, or many internally, and one to foreigners. Okay, now Jefferson wrote to Madison. This is after the convention. The convention was over in September. This is December. He's, he wrote him earlier and told him he likes the Federalist Papers, but, the, uh, and he does, but he thinks they should have a Bill of Rights. He's again repeating, uh, we want a Bill of Rights. Uh, okay, and he wants a Tenth Amendment. Uh, the Tenth Amendment says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states and the people, respectively. All right, that... was in, basically, that a similar wording was in the uh, Articles of Confederation, and Jefferson is pointing out that that word, that clause was in the original design, the former design, and it's not in here now, and you should put it back. Uh, the mission of the clause of our present Confederation was made, the reservation ex expressed. Now, in Federalist Paper 84, uh, I don't know here, um, Hamilton, I'll go back to this, I'm not talking about that. Uh, Hamilton argues that we don't need a Bill of Rights. He says, you know, leg, Article Article 1, Section 1 says, all legislative powers herein granted are vested in the Congress. And then Article 1, Section 8 enumerates all the powers they have. So Hamilton's objection to the Bill of Rights, it says it would contain various exceptions to powers which were not granted and therefore would give a plausible pretense for those disposed to usurp to claim a plausible pretense to claim others that weren't listed by saying, you know, so basically the Constitution, if you had a Bill of Rights that says you can't do this, 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 that, people would say, well, you didn't list this, so therefore I can't do it. We're going the opposite direction. Instead of listing the rights of the people, we're saying we're listing the rights of the government. And if we don't give you that power, you don't have it. So there's two ways of defining it, and that we're going with listing the powers of government, not listing the rights, is what he wanted to do. We ended up compromising and having a hybrid. So our government is a hybrid between a constitution and a bill of rights. And in order to make that happen, you can't understand the Ninth and Tenth Amendment unless you <coughs> understand that, that compromise, that they were against the bill of rights. So if you read the Ninth Amendment, it says the enumeration in the constitution Certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So, Ninth, Eighth, Ninth Amendment talks about rights of the people, Tenth talks about powers of government. So, what they're saying is, we have the freedom of press, freedom of this, we list a bunch of rights. The Ninth Amendment says, you shall not interpret the listing of all those rights, by, and then say, because you didn't list this right, you don't have it. What they're saying is, you have a lot of rights. We're going to list the big ones to make sure you don't cross that. But that doesn't mean that's all the rights you have. So the Ninth Amendment says the rights you have, all your constitutional rights, are not your only rights. You have other rights. Now, the Supreme Court went on and talked about the penumbra um, rights, and they, they somehow they just abor by abortion with that clause. Though. All right, so then I get to get to Jefferson on the foundation of the Constitution next. Skip that. Go to 
right here. Right, ready to go with Tom Jefferson. Uh, made a great statement as he was president. He vetoed a bank bill and uh, <coughs> the Constitution here. Uh, he called the Tenth Amendment the foundation of the Constitution. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read it here. It's not going to be on the screen. It's, it's in there, but I can't find it. Uh, I consider the this Thomas Jefferson in 1791 when he's president. He vetoed the bank bill, I think. I consider the foundation of the Constitution as laid on this ground. He didn't say Tenth Amendment, but he quotes it. All right, so you have to know, recognize Tenth Amendment. So he says that all powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states and the people. Right, to take a single step beyond the boundaries thus specifically drawn around the powers of Congress is to take possession of a boundless field of power no longer susceptible to any definition. And then he says the bank is illegal. So he's saying the Tenth Amendment is the foundation of the Constitution. Now, the Tenth Amendment was passed after the Constitution. So usually you build your foundation first and then you build something later. So it doesn't make sense, but uh, it was, the Tenth Amendment was, was in the Articles of the Confederation. It was implied in the design of the Constitution, but when they wrote the Ten Amendments, First Ten Amendments, they had another cover letter for that, and in there they ba they basically said this doesn't change the design; it just adds adds further declaratory and further restrictive clauses. So the Bill of Rights did not change the Constitution; they just clarified it, and Hamilton was somewhat right to be opposed to it because uh, I gotta get Hamilton. In uh we gotta find out that uh Hamilton in Federal Paper eighty four. I'm gone. I've been paid down but I'm going back. Is that right? Yeah you're going back. Did I hit the wrong key? Okay. If you number these pages in the future Next time you give a presentation, yeah, you don't know whether you're going forward or backward. I want to find Hamilton in Federalist Paper 84 talking about why he was opposed to the Bill of Rights. But I appreciate your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Jefferson Foundation. Okay, I'll just. Uh, Hamilton. That Tenth Amendment is one of the most ignored amendments we have, isn't it? I took a class in constitutional law at community college. The syllabus said they were going to talk about the Federalist Papers. I was all excited. <laughs> we talked about the Federalist Papers for three weeks, and then we read Time Magazine for 12. Oh, and in that conversation with this professor, he said, mm -hmm. we went over the amendments. He liked the First Amendment. And then he came to the Tenth Amendment, and he said, well, that's, that's basically obsolete now. And it went on. Yeah. And I didn't know oh, criminal. I didn't know Jefferson's foundation quote. I was, should have just if I'd known that I would have stopped him, stood up like I did a couple other times, at the limit how much you know. What do you say about the Tenth Amendment? Obsolete. He said the Tenth Amendment is basically obsolete. Obsolete. Did he so, say the Constitution basically is a diagram for government? It ain't really for us. Mm -hmm. He didn't mention that though. No. Well that's what it is though. Yeah. That's they a, don't even tell us we have unedible rights in there. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he was an atheist, too. That's, that's where the Bill of Rights came in. That's our, what we're telling him is what our rights are. That's the separation. Okay, I'll go with Matt, Federal 84 in my head here. Uh, Madison was opposed to the Bill of Rights. He says the Bill of Rights, uh, Bills of Rights are primitive in their nature in that they are stipulations between kings and their subjects and have no business in a government professedly founded on the power of the people. So in the kings and subjects, it was king had all power, except what you had in the Bill of Rights. And we are turning that on its head. We are saying, we the people have all the power, but to protect some of our property and rights, we're gonna give the government some power. So, and we're gonna have a 10th Amendment that says, uh, what we don't delegate to you, you don't have. You can't do whatever you want unless there's a clause that says you can't. That's what kings did. The kings did it whatever they want, except for the Magna Carta. Now, our governments can only do what they have specific grants of power to do. And I'm 
I go with the compound ripoff. Uh, in Federalist 51, my favorite Federalist paper, I quoted a few things here. There's another one here. Um, James Madison <laughs> talks about in the compound republic of America. He's basically describing the Tenth Amendment and what Jefferson calls the foundation. So the foundation of the design is talked about right here. In the compound republic of America. Never heard that term before, still here. And it makes sense. Basically, it's a republic of republics. The federal government is a republic. We have all the states that are republics. So it's a compound republic, republic, republic. In the compound republic of America, the power surrendered by the people. All right, we had the power. We created the government by surrendering our power. Not the king has power, he gives us rights. So the power surrendered by the people is first divided between two distinct governments, and then the portion allotted to each subdivid is subdivided among distinct and separate departments. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. This is one of his auxiliary precautions. We have state government and federal government, then we divided the power. We didn't concentrate the power in one federal government. It's divided, and that gives us double security. So now that the federal <coughs> government is being a lot larger than the state government, that security, double security, is going away, especially now that the federal government can just cut off funds to the states and make them do whatever they want. We basically have a, we compromise this design now due to the design change in the 17th Amendment. We now have a pretty much centralized government and the states are not uh, exercising the power they should. And uh, I don't have it here, the Federalist Paper 78 maybe, um, I forget which one, Hamilton Madison said, uh, we may safely rely on the disposition of the state legislature to erect barriers to encroachments by the federal authority. So he was saying whenever the federal government gets, he, he was arguing there that the federal government will never get too big and centralized because they had to take the power from the states. So, and he's going with human nature design again, the disposition, that's the power hungerness. The people in the state legislature, the governor and legislatures, they're power hungry politicians. If the federal government wants to centralize and take all their power, they have to take it from these guys and they want to, they're going to guard it. So we, it's a good quote, uh, we may safely rely on the disposition of the state legislature to erect barriers to encroach by the national authority, which, what were they thinking in 1913 when three-fourths of them ratified the 17th Amendment, taking that power away? So that was a bad year in 1913. Um, I guess the mix-up slide here. Anita Manson talking about... There we go, Madison. Two great Madison quotes. Uh, no doctrine can be sound that releases the legislature from the control of a constitution. The later is as much a law to the former as the acts of the former are to individuals. Now, what he's saying here is the constitution is as much a law to the legislature as the acts of the legislature are to us. So we the people, that's what our republic is. It's a government of laws, not of men. The government of men would be kings and nobles and all that. We have a government of laws where we the people wrote a law delegating them power. They write laws we have to obey. We only have to obey the laws they made that obey our laws. Uh, and then he goes on to say, although, all, although always liable to be altered by the people who formed it, the Constitutional Amendment, it is not alterable by any other authority, certainly not by those chosen to carry it into effect. So every year, two years, the government raises the debt limit. It's, they make a law for themselves, and then every year they change the law for themselves. So they're saying if it, with Constitutional Amendments, though, you don't do that. It's the people who are obeying the law don't make the law. Pretty simple concept. This is so vital a principle and has been so justly the pride of our popular government that a denial of it cannot possibly last long or spread far. Uh, but it does. Uh, okay. Another great massing quote is Charter of Liberty. Uh, he, in the National Gazette, that was like uh, uh, some of the conservatives, Federalists, had their own newspaper, kind of, and he wrote some articles in there. Uh, this is in 1792. Uh, he talks about, in Europe, charters of liberty have been granted by power. America has set the example, and Francis followed it, of charters of power granted by liberty. Mm -hmm. This revolution in the practice of the world may, with an honest praise, be pronounced the most triumphant epic in the history and its most consoling, consoling presage of its happiness. He likes it. That's what I'm interpreting that as. Uh, so basically, he's talking about charter of liberty granted by. This is a huge. I don't hear this anywhere. This is a huge 
aid to my understanding of the Constitution and Bill of Rights. A, uh, a charter of liberty, the Magna Carta was a charter of liberty granted by power. Our country is a charter of power granted by liberty. Right? That's, but our Constitution isn't just a charter of power, it's also a hybrid with the Bill of Rights. So uh, that's why the Hampton was against the Bill of Rights, but uh, it works out here. So one of the things you hear about is uh, under some emergency, what happens if you know, Ollie North was talking about a contingency plan in some kind of emergency to suspend the Constitution? And people go, wow, they suspended the Constitution. We wouldn't have any rights. That's wrong. The Constitution is their charter of power. If the government ever says, we have suspended the Constitution, then they ought to resign because they just dissolved themselves. <laughs> so we should